bisexuals. Who's betting on that one word getting us demonetized? In any case, there's our topic for this discussion. Bisexuality in video games, particularly in choice-driven games, such as role-playing games, dating simulators, and other games with an element of choice. Given the whole team over here at Game Assist is queer, and we've played a whole lot of games with both absolutely beautiful and god-awful queer stories, it's important to talk about the dangers of the player sexual, or everyone is bisexual, approach to building queerness into games. In this essay, we'll be discussing how bisexual and other queer representation in itself isn't good enough when narrative structures actually work to reinforce the structures of power and oppression which marginalise queer people, especially women, in the first place. Hello there, and welcome to Game Assist. You're meeting the whole team today, so it's time for some introductions. I'm Errol, and my pronouns are he, they. I'm Sarah, and my pronouns are she, they. And I'm Daz, and my pronouns are they, them. It wouldn't be a Game Assist video without providing you with some background information, would it? Firstly, we're going to be talking about a lot of games. So spoilers for the following. The Mass Effect franchise, the Dragon Age franchise, Arcade Spirits, Honey Pop, Max Gentleman Sexy Business, and Monster Prom. Alongside spoilers, it's just as important to provide you all with some trigger warnings. After all, in discussions like this we don't always cover the easiest topics. This video contains depictions and discussions of the following. Biphobia, homophobia, abuse, particularly from parents and carers, death and associated grief, misogyny, as well as transphobia. With all of our spoilers and warnings out of the way, let's dive into our key concepts so we have the material we need to cover all our bases. The definition of bisexuality that we will be using is the attraction to two or more genders. It is important to note that while some bisexual people can be transphobic, bisexuality does not exclude trans and non-binary people. Bisexuality is also not synonymous with polyamory, which refers to a relationship dynamic where an individual has a desire for, or is engaged in, romantic and or sexual partnerships with more than one person, with the informed consent of all those involved. Bi people face a lot of harmful stereotyping from both cis-heteropatriarchal culture and the LGBTQ community itself. Many assume that bisexuality is simply a phase, and that one day we'll realise that we're just straight or gay. It's important to note that it's totally valid to have phases in your sexuality and gender identity. Not only can sexuality and gender be fluid, but thanks to compulsory heterosexuality and binary gender, it's also difficult to figure these things out in a world that's constantly telling you to be straight and cis. All of us at Game Assist had pretty long straight phases ourselves. Others claim that bi people are promiscuous and more likely to cheat. A lot of this is based around the idea that because bi people can be potentially attracted to anyone, they must get around, have commitment issues, and not be able to form platonic relationships. But this, of course, is false. There are definitely bi people out there who cheat in relationships, but that doesn't mean that we all do it. Indecisive, promiscuous, greedy, attention-seeking, kinky, transphobic, likely to cheat. All of these negative stereotypes are used by society to other bisexuals. Biphobia is yet another tool in the belt of the cis-heteropatriarchy. We use the term cis-heteropatriarchy because the oppression of queer people serves the patriarchy, a system of male power. It raises people in strict gender binaries and forces them into relationships and family structures which uphold male power, wealth, and inheritance through reproduction. These tropes then serve to structurally and materially oppress bisexuals. We are left out of sexual and reproductive healthcare discussion and services based on our previous sexual encounters. We are too queer for some spaces and not queer enough for others. We are seen as cheaters, but only because our society presumes that if you can be in a relationship with a man, that is where you will always choose over any other relationship. All of this is very important to think about when approaching games, especially the ways that relationships are structured and presented. All games have narratives, even if storytelling isn't their overt purpose. All narratives are designed in certain ways and from certain perspectives. There's no such thing as a neutral perspective when creating any narrative, and this includes games too. Feminist film theory has given us some of the tools to understand this, as games, like films, are audiovisual narratives. 
These days quite popular is Laura Mulvey's theory of the male gaze, which argues that traditional Hollywood films are designed from a male heterosexual perspective, which presents women as sexual objects for the pleasure of men. This operates in the world of the film itself, for the pleasure of its male characters, but also in the world in which the film is made, as in this male-dominated industry, the man behind the camera is the one who frames the story and chooses what to put on screen. As the film's viewer, regardless of your gender, you occupy the position of male power through the film's design. But women are not only sexual objects in narratives, they are objects full stop. Teresa de Laretis argues that the narrative structures we see in contemporary cinema are based in a historical tradition of Western storytelling. Using the example of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex and other classic Greek plays and stories, she argues that Western narratives have historically been structured around the desires of men. The role that women serve in these narratives is simply to be vehicles in order for men to fulfill their desires. Their own perspectives and their own desires are not important. All of this is deeply relevant to games, particularly when they have a romantic or sexual element. In fact, it's probably doubly relevant due to the interactive nature of games, which means that you enact power not just through viewing and looking, but through your actions. In certain genres of games, you can create custom characters. Within certain limits, you can select the gender, race, and sexuality of your character. Even so, the game is written from a certain narrative perspective. This is because the writers have certain knowledge, power, and lived experience which informs their writing, consciously or not. Due to their gender, race, or sexuality, they experience the world in particular ways, because they hold certain positions of power within cis heteropatriarchal, white supremacist, capitalist structures of power. To take an example, in Daz's video essay on Honey Pop, they discussed how you can play either as a man or a woman in the game, but playing as a woman doesn't really change much. The game is still written from the same narrative perspective. This perspective is that of the gazing, desiring, heterosexual man, who sees and uses women as objects, sexual or otherwise. That is the power that you, as the player, hold over and enact on the women in the game. Regardless of the player character's gender, and regardless of the player's own gender, this is the position that you occupy when you're playing Honey Pop. So, on the surface, the increasing amount of games in which you can play as a bisexual person and romance bisexual people seems like a really good thing. But when dating, sex, and romance are literally a game, what does this mean for gendered dynamics of power, agency, and desire? As we've described, the material oppression that bisexual people face is framed by the structure of cis-heteropatriarchy. In video games, as in real life, you occupy a certain position within this structure of power. So, in video games, where you are bisexual and can date bisexual people, what position do you occupy? Regardless of your character's gender, it would seem that the vast majority of these games put you, as the player, in a position of male power. To use Teresa de Laretis' language, in these narratives you occupy the position of male hero human, or the gendered position of the subject, meanwhile NPCs whom you can date occupy the position of female obstacle boundary space, or the gendered position of the object. To take some examples, let's start with Max Gentleman's Sexy Business, a Victorian business tycoon game come dating simulator. Mechanically you play it as any gender you like, using the game's large variety of character customizations and three business tycoon pronoun options, sir, madame, and boss. You can also date whoever you like. On the surface, this seems like great representation, but in reality, the game is written from the rich, white, male perspective of a Victorian venture capitalist. You meet and hire executives to help you grow your business and defeat your rival, but these are also the characters that you date. Dating the executives helps you to level up their abilities, so it is beneficial to be dating a variety of executives to grow different stats. This unhealthy power dynamic between the male-coded business owner, the subject, and the female-coded employee, the object, serves to reinforce patriarchal gender roles and relationship structures. The bisexual NPCs are used as tools for the player to advance their business and progress in the game. 
Arcade Spirits is another dating simulator that, despite its gender inclusivity and thoughtful and progressive story, is a story of male venture capitalism at its core. You begin the story as an unemployed person with no real dream or goal for life, but through the help of your AI personal assistant, you find a new job at the almost failing Funplex Arcade. Throughout the course of the game, you care more and more about the arcade, and it becomes your dream to make it successful. The arcade's current owner, an old woman named Francine, fully trusts you to take her business and turn it into something greater, even though you are only hired as a floor attendant. The arcade was originally her late husband's, and since his passing, she has left the funplex in the hands of Gavin, the business manager. And so, the male-coded player character swoops in to save Francine's business and raise it to meet the standards of success according to a capitalist patriarchal society. The male coding of this narrative is especially prominent, as this story is about the games industry, a traditionally male-dominated field with a history of cis-heteropatriarchal violence. To draw on recent examples, Ubisoft is currently under fire for their decade-long history of sexual violence, racism, and other inappropriate workplace conduct. Similarly, gaming news outlet Kotaku, which has previously been heralded for its coverage of the Me Too movement in the gaming industry, has been accused by multiple parties of downplaying instances of sexual assault within their staff teams and putting the lives of survivors at risk. As a historically male-dominated industry, gaming has become a breeding ground for male abuse of power and objectification of women. RPGs like Dragon Age and Mass Effect are also clearly designed for men. The marketing for pretty much every single Dragon Age or Mass Effect game heavily, if not exclusively, features a male shepherd, warden, hawk, or inquisitor, often with a female love interest like Isabella in the Dragon Age 2 promos. Mass Effect 3 had a femshep trailer, but it certainly wasn't as prominent. In this context, bisexual women are framed within the male gaze, situated for the voyeurism of the male player. Even if the player character is a woman herself, the game design serves a male fantasy of any form of sapphic pleasure being an on-screen performance which exists for them, which is for male pleasure, not the women's own. Going back to Laura Mulvey, the phrase male gaze specifically refers to a heterosexual male gaze. This is even more evident when you examine the queer men, or lack of queer men, within both dating sims and role-playing games. Bisexual men are rather uncommon in comparison to bi women, and gay men are even harder to find. Gay men that you can pursue a relationship with? Even rarer. But we'll unpack this in some more detail later. As we've already argued, if these narratives centre you as the player in the gendered position of the masculine subject, they also place NPCs in the gendered position of the feminine object. In these games, regardless of their gender, dateable bisexual NPCs are the female obstacle boundary space to your male hero human. As Teresa de Laurentiis would argue, whether they are obstacles to or vehicles for your desires, they are objects, not agents of their own desires. In my previous video about the Honey Pop series, I established that these games are very clearly written from a cis heterosexual male perspective, which is why choosing to play the game as a female character has almost no effect on the gameplay itself. We learn nothing about the desires of the women we interact with, aside from some basic information that is used later in the game to improve your relationships. The effect of the male gaze and of the patriarchy's objectification of sapphic sexual relationships is even more present in Honey Pop's upcoming sequel, Double Date. As the title suggests, all of the dates in this game are between the player character and two of the NPCs, where the player has to manage the preferences of both girls when completing the date puzzle. The threesomes in Honey Pop 2 are entirely for the pleasure of the male-coded player character, as these girls seemingly express no desire to interact with one another sexually without the player character present. Even if you play this game as a female character, you are enacting patriarchal objectification on the NPCs and using them as objects for your fantasies, rather than allowing them to be agents of their own desires. Within cis-heteropatriarchy, the nuclear family is designed to serve a purpose to uplift, to entrench, and to ensure the inheritance of male power. It's all about reproduction, about knowing which man the baby belongs to in a world designed before DNA testing, so that power and wealth are upheld through male lineage. 
In my video on institutional racism in Life is Strange 2, I also alluded to the racialized aspect of this. In The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, the marriage function is exactly that, a function. Regardless of your spouse's gender, and regardless of the player character's gender, you reap material benefits from their role in the marriage. Every 24 hours in-game, you can obtain a home-cooked meal from your spouse, with food serving as a healing or stat boost function in-game, and you can also take part of the profit that they make in coin from opening up a shop. It's especially jarring to see characters like Aella the Huntress, a high-ranking member of the Companions, or Brynjolf, a high-ranking member of the Thieves' Guild, turn around and give up their entire lives in order to become 50s housewives. And if you adopt children in the game, your spouse takes care of them. Having children also reaps material benefits, as they bring you gifts each day. To hell with what your spouse wants, they cease to be agents of their own desires and merely occupy the role of passive housewife within the cis-heteropatriarchal nuclear family, becoming merely a vehicle for your desires and your material benefit. Looking into Dragon Age Inquisition, we have the complexity of the socially othered Iron Bull, a member of the Canari. The Canari are not a race of people in the way that we might traditionally understand, but rather a community that has structured their society around their interpretations of a religious philosophy called the Kune. Most of the Canari are a race of horned giants named the Kossith, but they also take elves, humans, and dwarves into their communities. This raises interesting questions about the social function and the historical fluidity of racialization. The Canari also serve in part as Dragon Age's analogy for a certain version or understanding of what a communist society might look like. So, as a group, they're already othered through racialized coding, this religious community following a philosophy that sounds suspiciously close to Quran, and political coding, considering the vitriolic public attitudes towards communism in the US ever since the 1950s. In his character arc, Iron Bull finds himself having to choose between supporting his people, the Cunari, in landing a ship to support the Inquisition, or saving his mercenary group, the Bull's Chargers. If he loses the Cunari ship, they banish him from their society, but in saving the Cunari ship, he loses his found family, the ragtag group of marginalised people who he's made a connection with over the years. Of course, he's completely disempowered. You make the choice as to who is saved and who is sacrificed. He doesn't get a say in it, and is surprisingly ambivalent in the situation. All of this is especially interesting, considering that Bull isn't only othered through his racialized and religious status as Kunari, as we've mentioned, but also due to his status as a pansexual character. Additionally, choosing the Kunari means he turns on you in the ending chapter of the Trespasser DLC, leading to his death. So only in you choosing his found family does Iron Bull survive. Bull is ultimately coded as a queer person of colour, forced to choose between his racialized and religious community and his queer found family. A clash of cultures narrative which is stereotypically found in mainstream depictions of queer people of colour in order to reinforce racist stereotypes about backwardness. All of this plays into the objectification of bisexual, in this case pansexual, people. It reinforces a heterosexual male power fantasy, where even characters who are as hypermasculine as this literal horde giant have their agency taken from them. Iron Bull is the quintessential racial and sexual other, and is disempowered throughout the storyline. Hello, Dows the Linguist here. Have you ever wondered how cheating came to be synonymous with infidelity? I hadn't really thought about it until we came to research this video, and boy oh boy are there some juicy links to capitalism and the patriarchy. The noun cheater has been in use since the early 14th century according to Etymology Online, where its original meaning was royal officer in charge of the king's escheats. So it was the cheater's job to look after the land and property that the king gained from his subjects dying without heirs, aka the land that the state had stolen from the public. The verb form of escheat, to cheat, first evolved through confiscate in the mid 15th century, to deprive unfairly in the 1580s, to deceive, impose upon, trick by the 1630s. At the same time, cheater came to mean dishonest player in the 1530s. The first attested use of to cheat on someone, with the meaning that it holds today, 
was in 1934. A discussion in r slash etymology on the overextension of cheat to infidelity suggests that love is already viewed as a game even outside the confines of the video game world. Fidelity is one of the rules of the game of love, and so if you break this rule you are a cheater. Also, if to cheat meant to deprive unfairly in the 1580s, this could be mapped onto the idea of infidelity. As alluded to earlier, before DNA tests, a man would have to know that his wife's child, his heir, was indeed his, purely by assuming that she had not been unfaithful. Therefore, if a woman is unfaithful in a marriage and has a bastard child, patriarchal society would see this as her depriving her husband unfairly of an heir, aka a vehicle for the continuation of his wealth and status. This allows us to link the socio-political roots of cheating as a concept rooted in capitalist and patriarchal control to cheating within games. If cheating is a way of enacting male power by lying and withholding information, cheating is something which historically women are vilified for doing, because of it calling into question the legitimacy and ownership of children, then cheating within games is also about male power. It reinforces the idea that these games are written from a heterosexual male perspective as when you cheat, most NPCs seem to just be fine with it. We often refer to characters in RPGs as player sexual. This means that characters don't have sexualities as such, but all are attracted to you, the player character. In many situations, the player character removes agency from NPCs and the romance paths due to the way these paths are structured. In many of these games, Bioware RPGs in particular, this agency is further denied and undermined through the act of lying and cheating on the characters who you end up in romantic relationships with. Their reactions are often rather subtle, only ever really leading to a slight negative response from potential partners. The player character takes agency away from NPCs by lying to them and cheating on them. NPCs seem to react differently to this depending on their gender and sexuality. You, the player, are the subject, the male-coded hero with agency in a patriarchal society where it's acceptable for men to cheat. Meanwhile, NPCs are female-coded objects to be controlled and cheated on. Hopping back over to Bioware, your character can be rather promiscuous, and it has very little effect upon your in-game relationships. In Dragon Age 2, you can hire male and female sex workers and flirt with side characters without it significantly impacting any main relationship you're having. If you take them with you, your in-game partner definitely knows about your hiring of sex workers, but doesn't comment on it. It's the same in Mass Effect 1, where you can sleep with Shaira the Consort, a mysterious Asari fortune teller come sex worker, and it has absolutely no effect on any of the relationships you're having at the time. In fact, it only seems to bite her in the ass rather than you. In Mass Effect 2, you discover she fled the Citadel after an information leak, and if you ever saw the consort, this information leak doesn't have any effect on you. In another situation in Dragon Age Inquisition, if you're not in a locked romance, therefore in a situation where you're basically just dating, you can optionally choose to flirt with and have sex with an Orlesian noblewoman in order to support your Antivan advisor, Josephine Montillier. In this situation, Josephine is completely disempowered, her family status is threatened by assassins sent by another family, leaving you to step in, because she has no control over her own fate, and it's you as the Inquisitor who uses this otherwise perfectly capable, influential and intelligent woman to enact a fantasy of saviorism in which she is the object. Should you choose not to fight fire with fire by sending assassins after assassins, we see other manifestations of patriarchal power at play. You, the Inquisitor, can seduce and have sex with a woman of high standing in order for your supporters to gain further power, thereby entrenching your own power and Josephine's as your advisor. Regardless of your own gender, you perceive this noblewoman as a sexual object, whom you use in order to enable your subordinates to claim power and further your own standing. Sex becomes a power-grabbing tool, and while the goal here is to restore the power of one woman under threat in Josephine, you use another woman as a sexual object in order to achieve this. This kind of act is treated as if it is one of the rules of the ruling class, that this element of infidelity is not just permitted, but potentially encouraged. Of course, since at this point you're not in a locked romance and are just dating, your potential partner or partner surely won't mind you sleeping with someone else, if they even know. On a meta-narrative level, many games offer achievements for romancing characters, while other games, usually ones mocking themselves as satire, whether they're satirical or not, will offer achievements for being, shall we say, promiscuous. This is questionable at best, deeply misogynistic and generally horrible at worst, reinforcing the idea of romance as conquest, of sex as an act of control. 
Look at the situation around Josephine from before. One answer to her family situation is military violence. Another involves sexual coercion. And only one involves strict diplomacy. Bully, Rockstar's school action sim, that's basically GTA in a uniform, offers you the over the rainbow achievement for kissing a number of boys in the school. Again, this makes perceived homosexuality or bisexuality a laughing matter, while simultaneously rewarding you for participating in what is essentially one big homophobic joke. In Honey Pop, it's impossible not to cheat. In fact, it's almost the aim of the game. However, one of the characters does confront you about it. Tiffany May asks the player character if they are seeing anyone else, and you are given three dialogue options. One is to just hesitate, which tells her all she needs to know. The second is define dating, and the third is to tell the truth about your several affairs, which she thinks is a joke. Although Tiffany reacts negatively to the news of your infidelity, she doesn't stop seeing you. In fact, the only negative impact in game terms is that you don't gain any extra points for this interaction. There is no obvious sign that what you are doing is wrong. In a very literal interpretation of gamifying dating, Monster Prom calls itself a competitive dating game. Unlike most dating simulators, Monster Prom is multiplayer, and you compete against your friends to win the prom date of your dreams. The social scenarios play out like turn-based combat, and you can up your stats by going to certain locations. Even though this game does have the option to take nobody to prom, whether you win or lose in the eyes of the game is entirely tied to your ability to secure your desired date. When I've seen this game played, the option to skip prom is usually only taken when someone's stats make it impossible for them to successfully date any of the characters. Whether the game makes it overtly clear or not, many of these games work purely on an approval point system, where your cumulative actions result in NPCs' changes in opinion towards you. In these situations, you're always able to work on and change someone's feelings towards you, usually by agreeing with everything they say. Of course, real people are more complex than that, and this system teaches that you can always win someone over. You just need to uncritically agree with everything they say or even lie to them. Especially gross if you're doing this to get in their pants to date them. All of this amounts to reinforce the male subject position of the player, reinforce stereotypes about bi people lying and cheating, and take agency away from NPCs, reinscribing their position as objects on which you enact your desire once again. In games with major moral choices, there are always characters that feel strongly against these, but if you're in a relationship with them, it's very unlikely that they will leave you or your party. For example, if you side with the mages in Dragon Age 2, and I mean you side with the mages or you're a fascist bootlicker, if you're in a relationship with Fenris, there's a much higher chance he will still side with you in spite of his vitriolic hatred of mages. And I mean he's got a real mage problem, which is a whole thing that Sara and I are going to delve into in the future. Dragon Age, we're coming for you. If the object of a game is to date, or to fuck, where does this leave the agency and the desires of NPCs? The narrative structure of traditional dating simulators does not allow for this. The player character is always centred as the hero and drives the story forward by using the NPCs as tools for progression. This isn't just the case for dates. Other elements of dating simulators are driven by the player using the NPC as a tool. We progress the rounds in Monster Prom by solving our classmates' dilemmas. We grow our business in Max Gentleman by having our love interests slash employees perform menial tasks and even fight on our behalf. The player is in the active, traditionally male-gendered role, and the NPC fulfills the passive, female-gendered role, obediently performing as expected to progress the narrative of the player. If you disagree, consider this. In any dating simulator that you've ever played, when have you been asked out by an NPC, rather than the other way around? When has the NPC ever rejected your advances? Not just because your stats are wrong, but because they simply weren't attracted to you. In contrast, look at most RPGs. The romantic plot lines are not centralised, instead coming second to the main plot. This should leave room for more in-depth characters who have significantly more agency in their actions, in theory. In some situations, heck, you get some characters directly asking if you're comfortable with them flirting with you. Zevran in Dragon Age Origins is a perfect example of this. If you don't consent to his flirtatious nature, he politely reels it in, knowing that you're not comfortable with it. In most other situations, however, it feels like a main plot with a tacked-on romance minigame, 
Interweaving real-life characters with the plot that exists, making their sexuality feel like a real part of their developed character in a way that doesn't subscribe to tropes and actually makes their decisions worthwhile, giving them agency to make some of their own romantic decisions throughout the course of the game in more depth, maybe even pursue relationships with other characters without your direct input as a response to each other's actions. We only see that here and there with characters like Sarah and Dorian who can optionally end up in relationships with Dagna and Iron Bull respectively. Unfortunately, you don't get to see those relationships truly unfold. There is a final consideration which, even with the main focus of the essay being on bisexuality, we think it's important to consider. How do the gays fit into all of this? In RPGs and dating sims, the trend for representation of queer sexualities seems to lean towards bisexual people rather than gay men and lesbians. The exceptions are usually found in gender-locked dating sims like Dream Daddy, where you play as a man dating men. The dateable NPCs in Dream Daddy tend to be presumed gay or bisexual, but you have no real way of knowing, because this is entirely a presumption based on sexual history, and you really shouldn't presume someone's sexuality based on their sexual history. I can't even think of any gender-locked sapphic dating sims, and that makes me sad. The developers of Arcade Spirits appear to be aware of the issues surrounding assumed sexuality and attraction mechanics in dating simulators, but instead of creating a character roster with established sexualities, they essentially wrote sexuality out of the game. Mechanically, all of the NPCs are bisexual, as they are all dateable by the player character, but within the canon of the game, they never directly express this to you. When it comes to choosing who to date, the player character asks their AI PA, Iris, how she's certain that the NPCs are attracted to them. Iris then explains that she wouldn't suggest someone to date unless they were already interested in you. Again, this could have been an opportunity for only select NPCs to become available for dating, but instead you can choose any of the main gang. The NPCs are not agents of their own desires, their sexuality is never discussed and it is assumed that they will say yes to the player if chosen especially if their stats match up. The player character is then mimicking the patriarchal power fantasy of men being able to get whoever they want, which simultaneously pushes the heteronormative idea that bisexual men are actually gay, bisexual women are actually straight, and lesbians can be turned by men if they try hard enough. Canon queer monosexual characters, that is, queer people who are attracted to one gender, are actually not that common in video games, whether as NPCs, romanceable NPCs, or playable characters. Playable characters are usually established personalities, like Ellie from The Last of Us, or Kian Alvani from Dreamfall Chapters, not custom characters who you can only really headcanon as monosexual or bisexual either way. The everyone is bisexual approach to RPGs and dating sims, for the reasons we've already discussed, feels like pretty disingenuous representation of bisexual people and their experiences in the first place, and it strongly reinforces cis-heteropatriarchal structures. One of the facets of this is actually the erasure of gay men and lesbians in these games. To illustrate this, we're going to take another look at the Dragon Age and Mass Effect series. Earlier, we alluded to the idea that bisexual women are designed into a lot of games for a voyeuristic male gaze, perpetuating the trope that bisexual women are actually straight and aren't agents of their own desires, particularly their desire for women. This explains the lack of lesbians in many games too. Lesbian identity is all about women loving, desiring, and centering women, and their lack of desire for men is a threat to patriarchal culture, which is designed to entrench the power of men. I was particularly struck by this in Dragon Age Origins, in the character of Leliana. When you play as a female warden, Leliana never expresses attraction to men, even rebutting and appearing clearly put off by advances from Zevran. She consistently expresses attraction to women in dialogue, speaking about her time at the Chantry and her love of and desire for some of the women there, though that forbidden fruit line definitely feels like it was written by a man, even flirting with Morrigan at one point, if you have them both in your party. 
The DLC Leliana song recounts her passionate love of Marjolaine, who betrayed her and destroyed her life, hence her need to seek refuge in the Chantry in the first place. Leliana's companion mission in the game is all about Marjolaine and moving on from this heartbreak. Marjolaine herself certainly fulfills some awful tropes about traitorous, lying, cheating bisexuals, interestingly enough. In any case, Leliana is a woman who loves, desires, and centers women in her life. Importantly, there is a very distinct lack of desire for men. Yet, a male warden can romance her. This is a really jarring experience, because it's inconsistent with her character, and it doesn't feel like what she would really want. Simply put, it feels like she was written as a lesbian, then shoehorned into being romanceable by a male player character, because she's hot and men want to have her. In this 2009 game, which, as we've said, is clearly marketed to a male audience and designed for the male gaze, this checks out. In Mass Effect, as a male Commander Shepard, you can only be in a romantic relationship with a man in Mass Effect 3. One of the two, yes, two, men you can be in a relationship with is Caden Alenko, who has been straight in previous games, but is now suddenly bisexual in this instalment. A complete lack of consistency compounded by the fact that Caden might not even be alive by the time this game rolls around. You might have unintentionally killed off one of the few queer men back in Mass Effect 1 when he was coded as straight. Oh, and depending on your relationship with him in Mass Effect 3, you might have to kill him again, too. Your relationship with Caden is significantly less fleshed out if you're a man, since you don't have the background that Femme Shep would have in the same situation, as she's had the chance to develop that romantic relationship with Caden in previous games. You just don't get the same experience as a man in a relationship with Caden. It's very clear to me as a bisexual throughout romancing Caden as a man that he was designed to be straight, and always was designed to be straight, as it feels this experience was simply shoehorned in to allow for a single bisexual romanceable man. Caden and Leliana are not written as bi characters. They are both written as characters who are clearly monosexual and only attracted to women, but they're shoehorned in as bi in order to make them romantically and sexually available to men in game. It feels really clear that neither of them would choose or want relationships with men, and their agency is taken away. As a quick aside, the day we initially released this video, and then had to take it down for some edits, Gaming Magazine published an article confirming that Leliana was indeed not designed as a bisexual character, but also, nor was Zevran. New information from David Gader, lead writer of the Dragon Age series, tells us that both of these characters were made to be bisexual out of convenience. That very much flew under our radar, considering Zevran is very much written as the bisexual stereotype that we've mentioned before. Interestingly, the exact reason that Laleana was made into a bisexual character wasn't discussed. Having said that, it's nice to be right sometimes, huh, Sara? This just reinforces the idea that queer relationships in games such as dating sims and RPGs are almost exclusively designed for straight men. If they want to date men, they'll play as a woman. If they want to date women, they can choose either binary gender depending on how fetishistic they're feeling at the time. If you are in fact looking for a decent representation of men loving men, we still have a long way to go. Gay men seem to be stuck with stories relating to sadness. Their tales centre around homophobia, trauma or death, as if this is required to justify the presence of a homosexual man in a game, as if their inclusion requires some kind of trauma to allow them to exist. Unfortunately, this seems to be done to humanise these men, as they are the only characters who aren't designed for a cisgender, heteronormative male gaze. They're not objectified like straight women or bisexual characters, but they're still treated poorly. Let's take a look at Dorian's story arc in Dragon Age Inquisition. One of my favourite characters, a beautifully blunt and bitchy man. His story arc follows the age-old tale of fleeing from home because his parents, particularly his father, didn't understand or accept that he was gay. It's a tokenistic representation of his identity that refuses to allow gay men to be anything but the coming out trope where Iron Bull represents the bisexual trope of an inability to choose and lacking true friends, Dorian only gets to represent the story told over and over again, that only ever hurts. And he's the only gay man you can romance in the Dragon Age series as of yet. In Mass Effect 3, you also only have one gay man that you can romance. Steve Cortez's story is all about gay trauma, see, he was married beforehand, and his plot centres around the fact that he is a widower and his husband was killed in the war with the Reapers. This leads to a storyline focused entirely on loss and grief and the slow process of recovery. 
Again, this is a tale that is very much embedded in stories about gay men. Particularly looking at the AIDS crisis, gay men have time and time again had to lose their loved ones and experience that grief. Telling this kind of story again and again only reinforces that idea that loss is a natural part of being a gay man. This is, again, compounded by the ending of Mass Effect 3, which can lead to both Steve's death and Shepard's. By contrast, in what initially seems like a strange turn of events, there is no lesbian trauma plotline for Samantha Trainer, the token lesbian of the Mass Effect series, or Sarah, the token lesbian of the Dragon Age series. Sam is just a bit of a cardboard cutout of a middle-class British Asian stereotype whose most memorable character trait is her love of a toothbrush, and Sarah is a manic pixie dream girl with a whole lot of internalised elf racism going on. It would appear that lesbophobia doesn't really factor into their lives. So much mainstream media outside of games, such as film, television, and novels, are saturated with dead and traumatized lesbians, so it seems weird that while the trend of gay men being defined by homophobic trauma would persist in games, it might not for lesbians. The thing is, RPGs and other self-insert games, as we've discussed, are structured around the desires of heterosexual men. It should come as no surprise, then, that men might play as lesbians for their own desires and wouldn't want the lived experience of lesbophobic violence to sully their fantasies. Thinking about the structural oppression that lesbians face is a bit of a turn-off for the heterosexual man. They just want the quirky character traits and the odd sexy shower scene. These romanceable lesbians are 100% designed for the male gaze, designed as objects for male pleasure. With all of this in mind, it's really interesting to note that Leliana is the only sapphic character of the three whose storyline was written by a woman, Cheryl Chi. And Cheryl has done a great job of making Liliana by far the most interesting and nuanced sapphic character across all of her appearances in the Dragon Age series. Though it feels that attraction to men was thrust upon her, and we can't be sure about the gender dynamics in the writing team, though we can certainly imagine, Liliana is complex enough to have a life of her own beyond that. She's complex enough for me to have a sense of her desires being more complicated than the surface level of game mechanics would lead you to believe. By contrast, Sarah, Dorian, Steve Cortez, and Samantha Trainer were all written by men. In a blog post with Patrick Weeks and Dusty Everman, the writers for Samantha Trainer and Steve Cortez's storylines respectively, we can see Weeks discussing how he didn't want his writing to look like a straight guy writing lesbians for other straight guys to look at. I can't say he succeeded. Similarly, we can see how Everman's writing was influenced by gamers' homophobia, and the fact that they can't read the room when it comes to gay men. Everman himself noted that players had concerns, which we read as homophobia, over what they called getting ninja romanced, where a relationship shifts from friendly to romantic to the player's surprise, and these concerns seem greater for same-sex romances which is amusing considering the amount of times that straight characters have jumped from platonic to romantic interest in RPGs without me indicating any interest, but they actively worked against this for the only gay man they had in the game. In lieu of that, there's an incredibly complex romance path that requires you to go off the Normandy to interact with Cortez in a way that I would consider just a little bit more awkward to reach and work through than other characters within the game and the series as a whole. The only presumably monosexual queer people that we encounter in Arcade Spirits are Ben and Matt, the owners of Whole Story. As they are already in a relationship, they are not romanceable. Ben and Matt's sexuality is markedly a character choice here, as they play the role of supportive hipster father figures to the player character, whose actual parents do not appear in the game. The relationship is very overtly loving and, frankly, adorable, but this contrasts quite starkly with the lack of relationship and sexuality discussion from the actually romanceable bisexual NPCs. Their queerness is highlighted to help the player character along, whereas the NPC's queerness is hidden, just to do the same. Ultimately, being gay is a character choice which is poorly dealt with, but being bisexual is a gameplay choice, and it shows. Women exist for the pleasure of men and writers have no idea what to do with men with same-sex interests other than shove them into awkward stereotypical situations. When it comes to bisexuals, we don't get to exist. Instead, being slotted in with no sexuality and being player-sexual. 
we need to discuss the agency of queer characters and how they get to interact with the worlds around them. Even the ones that supposedly exist in a space where sexuality doesn't matter. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and listen to all three of us ramble about a topic we are very much passionate about. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a like, and be sure to comment below to start a discussion about this. We're always interested in your views. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. We genuinely couldn't do this without you. Special thanks to Ditsy Doggy, B, Najib, and Charlotte. If you aren't a patron already, please consider supporting us over at patreon.com forward slash gameassistyt. You can find us over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for further discussions and conversations. Thank you for watching, and until next time, take care.